There is often a big divide between those who enjoy tournament style point fighting versus continuous medium to full contact sparring. Hey look, I get it. One is a glorified game of tag and the other is a more realistic approach to what real fighting might be like. But what if I told you that glorified game of tag could actually prove even the hardest of full contact bouts? Yes, even MMA. Well, here are eight ways it could do just that. And if you hang with us for just a few minutes, I'm going to show you a badass upcoming tournament that you're going to be soon hearing about. And trust me, you don't want to sleep on this one. Okay, so let's start with the obvious. The first person to get the hit gets the point. That's the whole crux of point sparring is that it is a game of tag. Whoever gets there first gets the point. Now, if you take this tactic and you apply it to other forms of sparring, like for example, normally I am a continuous fighter. I like continuous sparring and I am sometimes willing to take a hit if it gets me closer to pull off a combination. I've got the body mass to do it. I've got the size. Actually, a lot of the guys I spar with, they call me the wall because I can take the hits and absorb them. And I'm willing to do that if it puts me in a favorable position. That won't work in point sparring because if I do that, obviously that first point is going to go to my opponent. So. I've recently started competing again, and I'll get back to that, but getting back to the tournament mindset has actually sharpened my fighting because now I have to break out of my defensive, my normal defensive fighting. I am now putting myself forward, being a little bit more assertive because I got to get that first point. And I've seen the difference. It's made me more effective of a fighter. I've had people come up to me telling me that they're noticing that I'm landing more shots than normal. So by forcing myself out of my comfort zone, and trying to be the first one to strike, it's actually improved my sparring. So yes, even though it's just points, it does develop your offensive fighting tactics because first one who gets there is first one who gets the point. So it better be you. So this one is actually tied to the previous point. Before you can strike first, you have to commit to something. And as a TV director I once worked for told me a long time ago in regards to camera movements, don't be tentative. He told me either do the shot or don't do the shot. Same thing here in sparring. You, you have to choose an action and you have to follow through on that action. And when it comes to tournaments, you know, being aggressive and getting that, that first strike and you, you gotta commit to something. And sometimes you can sell a strike if you commit. So confidence and commitment plays well in sparring. And also too, when it comes to whether it's MMA, a cage match, a street fight, sparring, it doesn't matter. You don't have time to second guess yourself. Self-defense and martial arts gives you tiny micro windows to act. And if you miss that window, you have to move on and do something else. Don't be tentative, commit. A big criticism of traditional martial arts is a lot of people say when it comes to the actual sparring, it just looks like crappy kickboxing. Well, it can. I mean, it's easy to get in there and just start throwing punches and kicks because your mind switches from an analytical mind to more of an action-based responsive mind. Um, but sparring, is a good opportunity to use this as a sandbox. There's no reason why you can't look at your bunkai or your self-defense techniques and take portions of them and actually put them to the test. And if stuff doesn't work right offhand, analyze it and ask yourself, well, how would it work? You can usually modify a lot of things. You know, I come from a background in Kempo and I use Kempo all the time in sparring. You know, I don't just go out there and throw punches and kicks mindlessly. And anything from the basics, leg checks and particular strikes and blocks and foot maneuvers, all the way up to actual techniques. I've used several of our techniques in sparring. Even recently, I pulled off a technique called circles of protection. I honestly didn't think it was going to work. I was experimenting in my head. was like, well, what happens if I do this? I actually got the block applied. I got the counter grab. I did the whole circle. I did the whole check. I did everything except I hesitated on that last move because I was kind of surprised it worked and I hesitated for that last strike that my opponent was able to back up and get out of the way. Had I committed, you see, you commit. Had I gone with the, through with the technique, I would have landed that shot. This is not a street fight. This is, sparring is part of practice. So it's a good time to take your techniques and put them to the test and see what you have to modify and see what works for you. Now the thing about point sparring is, it might look like a game of tag, but it can actually be a much bigger workout than it seems like it would be. You know, traditionally, I do continuous sparring, and I can go anywhere from three to seven minutes, depending on how, how intense we're going. But when I point spar and we do a two minute round, I almost feel like I've gotten the same workout. And it's mainly because it's so much start, stop, quick burst, start, stop, quick burst. It's all about that intensity. It's all about getting there first. The focus is different that after two minutes of that, it feels like the same workout as a three to five minute, you know, three to seven minute sparring session. And even recently, you know, like I said, I've been competing recently, and we do sparring in class, and after we did maybe a couple hours of point sparring, totally wiped out, totally exhausted, did another two hours of regular continuous sparring, 
and it felt much more relaxed. It was much more smooth sailing. I was lasting longer. I even found I had more energy. And it's just, it's just interesting to realize that how much effort and compacted energy you put into a point sparring match. And that's actually a really good way to get your workout on. And since you're gonna be sweating so much, you're also gonna to wanna to have a change of clothes, which is why I heavily recommend you visit our website at artofwindojo.com and pick up one of our sweet, sweet shirts. We have shirts that commemorate the different martial arts and the martial arts masters. So be sure to go grab your shirt. Don't think about it. Don't hesitate. Commit. Don't be tentative. In point sparring, it's a very common occurrence that the judging might not always be accurate. There's several times where you might land a shot that the judges don't see, or they count something that didn't land on you. It happens, they're human, and in very many cases, they're volunteers. So you gotta have to realize that there's some margin of error there, which is why you need to make sure that your techniques are sharp. Yeah, you might score a point by going in with a flurry, but you're much more likely to score a point if it's clear and defined as a strike. And this is something that um, I experienced recently. Um, I'm gonna get back to the story on the competition that I had experience with this, but sometimes you might land a shot that isn't seen. So it is up to you to commit, you know, dedicate that first strike and show a clean, sharp technique. You make every point undeniable. So we talked about the offense, now let's talk about how point sparring can affect your defensive game. You know, in a tournament fight, you're not gonna wanna just stand there and just deflect a whole flurry of attacks coming at you. You're gonna wanna move around. Because even if they throw five, six, seven strikes at you and you manage to block them all, from a judge's point of view, they might see one get in or think they see one gets in. They're also seeing one person just standing there doing deflection while the other one's committing and going in for the strikes. You might lose some points that way, even if you do block them all. In a tournament, as much as a real fight, you don't wanna just stand there, you wanna be very dynamic. You wanna move around, control distance. If you see an opening, get in there, get that strike, and then move around. Position yourself for your next strike. So in a tournament, in a real fight, block what you have to, but don't just stand there and keep blocking. Act on it, either move or move in in advance. So this is a great chance to work on your defensive game as well. Best way to avoid punch, no be there. This seems like a weird one to put on the list because everyone knows you're supposed to breathe, but it's surprisingly easy to forget to do when you're in the heat of the moment. Doing that effort, one, helps you commit. Two, um, if you do a strong ki in a tournament, you might actually help sell a point because the judges are gonna see your effort. And you might even possibly even intimidate your opponent. Not always, but it might be a factor in there. But you wanna keep that breath going. You want that oxygen in your blood. You wanna be able to be relaxed and you wanna be able to move. And also too, in, in a real altercation, be noisy. You know, if someone's really trying to fight you, be noisy, you might be able to attract attention that way, maybe help can arrive. Yes, you are in a controlled setting. Yes, you're in a ring with a referee. That does not mean your environment doesn't play a factor. There are still boundaries. There are still vantage points. There is still an environment that you can utilize. In many tournaments, there's rules that talk about going out of bounds. If you go out too many times, it might cost you a point. Also, typically, if you're outside the bounds, you can't score a point, but they can score on you. So use that to your advantage. Flip that around. Utilize the fight. Try to position your opponent, because if, if you can get them outside the ring, you can hit them usually, and they can't hit you. Who's gonna get the point? Even if they land stuff on you, they can't score a point. Use that to your advantage. Additionally, you've got vantage points of the judges. You might have one judge, you might have three, you might have five. You don't know what they can see. So you might wanna position yourself for certain techniques where the head judge or the lead ref can see clean techniques that you're delivering or maybe face away from a judge if they're kind of doing a flurry at you where it's harder to see. You still have an environment in play. Use your surroundings, even as simple as it is as a mat and with lines on the ground, you can still use that to your advantage. The environment is still very much a factor. Speaking of awareness, I wanna bring up an awesome tournament that's coming this November. You don't wanna miss it because it's shaping up to be one of the largest, if not the largest, tournament slash expos in the country, and it's being held right here in sunny South Florida. Come out and meet some of the biggest martial arts legends and compete for a high stakes grand prize. Yes, this prize is not an accumulation of all the prizes. Some people will actually be going home with this amount. Now the team hosting this event and putting it together is a Kempo group, but it's open to all styles. If you can stand and you can fight, you are invited. So if you are a Kempo guy and you want to prove that yes, it is as effective and badass as we already know it is, well come on out and show it. And if you don't think that Kempo is effective, well then, if you think your art's better, well, you're invited to come out and prove that as well. And who knows, I myself may throw my hat into the ring. It's going to be an awesome event. 
Battle of the Martial Arts. You can find the link in the description below. Everything from rules, registration, to accommodations, it's all there. Definitely check it out. Now, of course, it's very important to distinguish point sparring from a real fight. You know, in a real fight, there are no points, there's no referee, and there's no time buzzer. But you can always still practice and work technique and sharpen skills that could help you in a real situation. Now, I recently just started competing again. Uh, I haven't competed since I was 29. I am now 45. So this year is the first time in 16 years I've been to a tournament. It's one of those things, I'm getting older. I'm feeling, I'm starting to feel my age. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to be 10 years from now wishing I had done this. So while I can still do it, I'm doing it. And it's been a great experience so far. Um, as of this episode, I have um, competed into two tournaments and they were smaller, but they were perfect for me getting my feet wet. And each tournament, you know, I came down to me and one other guy and I won second place for both of them, but I don't feel bad. Actually, I feel great because the first tournament, it was me and this other man, half my age, much better shape than I was, and he's been competing all this time. He won six to five. I came close. I'm really happy that I made him work for it. I even landed some solid shots on him, so I walked away feeling great. That first time in 16 years, I, I, I did that, I felt great. And then the second one was a couple weeks later. Again, it came down to me and this other man, half my age, competitive tournament fighter, at least a foot taller than I was, and he won five to four. And this is where we're talking about judging. I don't usually like the bad mouth judging, but I do feel like I was kind of robbed on this one because there were several times where I scored a point and four out of five judges would give it to me and the center ref goes, oh, well, that's not enough. Typically, when you get the majority of the judges, it should be a point to you. And there was even one judge, I had four judges point to me and the fifth judge just kind of stood there blankly and they asked him and they asked him and he goes, and he pointed to me. The center ref goes, okay, that's not enough. So there were at least three points that I know, I know I landed that were not counted. So the score probably should have been closer to five, uh, seven, five, but you know what? Honestly, like I said, you've got to commit. They are human. It was my job to be clear and concise and make it undeniable. I didn't do that. So I take the responsibility onto myself. And it's something I learned now going forward is you have to have that, that clean technique. You have to make it undeniable. So that is definitely something to learn and take from, from a tournament experience. So I'm definitely planning to compete some more just so that I know that I put myself out there and that while I can still do it, I tried and I went out there and I pushed my boundaries. And besides, who knows? Maybe I'll end up seeing one of you guys on the mats one day. And since I'm using age as my motivation to train and to compete, that brings up a very good question. 